reading through the Bible in one year, September 1st, 1 Samuel 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Ezekiel 4, and Psalms 40 through 41. Samuel died, and all Israel assembled to mourn for him, and they buried him by his home in Ramah, which is near Bethlehem. David then went down to the wilderness of Paran. A man in Moan had business in, or had a business in Carmel. He was ver a very rich man with 3,000 uh, sheep, 1,000 goats, and was shearing his, his sheep in Carmel. The man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name, Abigail. The woman was intelligent and beautiful, but the man, a Calebite, was harsh and evil in his dealings. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men instructing them, Go up to Carmel, and when you come to Nabal, greet him in my name. Then say this, Long life to you, and peace to you. Peace to your family, and peace to all that is yours. I hear that you are shearing. When your shepherds were with us, we did not harass them, and nothing of theirs was missing the whole time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. So let my young men find favor with you, for we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have on hand to your servants and to your son David. David's young men went and said all these things to Nabal on David's behalf, and they waited. Nabal asked them, who, who is David, and who is Jesse's son? So he recognizes who he is. Many slaves these days seem to be running away from their masters. Am I supposed to take my bread and my water and my meat that I butchered for my shearers and, and give them to these men? I don't know where they are from. So he's, he's insulting David by basically saying that he's, he's just a slave who's run off and that's all that he is. Again, everybody else knows that he will be king, but he, he's basically aligning himself with Saul. David's young men retraced their steps. When they returned to him, uh, they reported all these words. And David said to his men, All of you, put on your swords. So each man put on his sword. And David also put on his sword. About 400 men followed David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. One of Nabal's young men informed Abigail, Nabal's wife, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed at them. The men treated us very well. Uh, when we were in the field, we weren't harassed and nothing of ours was missing the whole time we li were living among them. There was, uh, sorry, they were a wall around us both day and night. The entire time we were with them herding the sheep, so they were protecting them the whole time. Now, consider carefully what you should do, because there is certain to be trouble for our master and his entire family. He is such a worthless fool, nobody can talk to him. Abigail hurried, taking two hundred loaves of bread, two clay jars of wine, five butchered sheep, and a bushel of roasted grain, one hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on the donkeys. Then she said to her male servants, Go ahead of me, and I will be right behind you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. As she rode the donkey down uh, from a mountain pass hidden from view, she saw David and his men coming toward her and met them. David had just said, I guarded everything that belonged to this man in the wilderness for, for, for nothing. He was not missing anything, yet he's paid me back evil for good. May God punish me and do so severely if I let any of his males survive until morning. Now this is a, this is a vow. Right? This is a promise. We've seen Jephthah make the same kind of vow um, where he said that in celebration, whatever exits his house after he was successful in battle, he said whatever exits his house, he will uh, sacrifice to God. And God tested him by this by sending out his daughter. Again, something that nobody ever would have asked him to do. God never asked him to sacrifice his own daughter. He could have reversed that vow at that time, but he chose not to. 
We've also seen others make the same kind of claims. Saul himself made the same kind of claim that uh, when he was fighting with the Philistines, anybody who ate any food until they were all destroyed um, would have to die. And then his own son did it. Now, the only thing that stopped him from slaughtering his own son, the one who, through which God saved them and allowed them to defeat the Philistines, the only reason he didn't uh, slaughter him was because the people said, no. Now here, David is saying the same thing. He said, look, I have taken care of this man and his property. I have fought for him. We have been a wall separating um, them from all of the evil people around them who might come to steal the sheep or, or, or the, the animals or any other thing that could come up. And they've been perfectly safe this whole time and we've taken care of them. And yet he's treated us evil for all the good we've done for him. And that's when he says, he gives this vow saying, um, may God punish me and do so severely if I let any of his males survive until morning. This is again, the same type of vow. But now Abigail, Nabal's wife comes to David and she says, sorry, she sees him and quickly gets off her donkey and kneels down with her face to the ground and pays homage to David. She knelt at his feet and said, The guilt is mine, my lord. But please, let your servant speak to you directly. Listen to the words of your servant. My lord should pay no attention to this worthless fool, Nabal, for he lives up to his name. His name means stupid, and stupidity is all that he knows. Again, don't name your children stupid. Throwing that out there. I don't know who that's for, but I'm assuming it's for somebody. I, your servant, didn't see my Lord's young men whom you sent. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, it is Yahweh, the Lord, who kept you from participating in, in bloodshed and avenging yourself by your own hand. May your enemies be like, sorry, and those who intend to harm uh, my Lord, so him, be like Nabal, meaning stupid. Let this gift your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord is certain to make a lasting dynasty, or dynasty, how you read that, uh, for my Lord, because he fights the Lord's battles. Throughout your life, may evil not be found in you. Someone is pursuing you and intends to take your life. My Lord's life is tucked safely in the, pl in the place where, where the Lord your God protects the living. But he is flinging away your enemies' lives like stones from a sling. When the Lord does for my Lord all the good he promised you and appoints you ruler over Israel, there will not be remorse for a troubled conscience for my, for my Lord because of needless bloodshed or my Lord's revenge. And when the Lord does good things for my Lord, may you remember me your servant. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you to meet me today. May your discernment be blessed, and may you be blessed. Today you have kept me from participating in bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. He's like, look, okay, I made a promise. I'm going to stop it. I'm not going to do it. Whereas everybody else has gone through with these, these rash vows, he says no. He's putting a stop to it today. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, who prevented me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, Nabal wouldn't have left, so I wouldn't have any males left by morning light. Then David accepted what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. See, I have heard what you said, and I have granted your request. Then Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was in his house, holding a feast fit for a king. Nabal's heart was cheerful, and he was very drunk, so she didn't say anything to him until morning light. In the morning, when Nabal sobered up, his wife told him about these events, and his heart died, and he became a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck him dead. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord, who championed my cause against Nabal's insults, and restrained his servant, 
and David from doing evil. The Lord brought Nabal's evil deeds back on his own head. Again, allowing God to be your defender and your avenger. Then David sent messengers to speak to Abigail about marrying him. When David's servants came to Abigail in Carmel, they said to her, David sent us to bring you to him as a wife. She stood up, paid homage with her face to the ground, and said, Here I am, your servant, a slave to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Then Abigail got up quickly, and with her five female servants accompanying her, rode on the donkey following David's messengers, and so she became his wife. David also married Ahinoam of Jezreel, and the two of them became his wives. But Saul gave his daughter, Michael, David's actual first wife, to Palti, son of Laish, who was from Galim. And let me bring up, wow, there's a lot of notes that this just skipped over here. Let me go ahead and pull them up for you really quick. Again, I strongly recommend reading the notes. These are really, really good. It explains a lot about what's going on behind the scenes that you don't normally see. There we go. All right, let's move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Whew. Paul now continues. If any of you has a dispute against his brother, how dare you take it to court before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge these trivial cases? Don't you know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So, if you have such matters, do you appoint as your judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is not one wise person among you who is able to arbitrate between fellow believers? Instead, brother goes to court against brother, and that before unbelievers. As it is, to have legal disputes against one another is already a defeat for you. Why not just simply be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Again, the implication is in Christ. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Quote, Everything is permissible for me, unquote, but not everything is beneficial. Now, I'm going to read the note on this because this one's important. Um, so Paul may be quoting sayings, probably common sayings in Corinth, that were used to excuse immoral behavior. Note the repetition, again with cor qualifying corrections. At 10.23, we'll see the same. The Apostles' corrective rejoinder suggests that, even if there is an element of truth in these slogans, the Corinthians have perverted it. Indeed, his qualifications have the effect of denying the very point of these sayings. And he ends by emphasizing that the noble purpose for which God has, rather, he emphasizes um, the noble purpose for which God has given us bodies. Freedom in Christ is deployed in what is helpful to others and does not lead us to be dominated by our sinful desires, a senseless return to enslavement. So we see this here in the first one, everything is permissible for me. Again, this is what the Corinthians would typically say, but he twists it around, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. 
Again, he gives them another one of their other quotes. Uh, Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food. Another Corinthian slogan. This may assume a parallel between hunger for food and the sexual drive as a pretext for justifying any form of sexual indulgence as natural and irresistible. Paul will not permit such trivializing of sexuality, nor of the physical body itself. Its appointed end for Christians is not the destruction in the grave, but resurrection by God's power to enjoy eternal blessing in the new heaven and new earth. Those who die before the return of Christ and the final resurrection enjoy a spiritual existence with Christ in heaven, and their spirits will be reunited with their bodies at the resurrection. Let's continue on. Rereading verse 13 now. Uh, Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will do away with both of them, both food and the stomach. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. God raised up uh, in the Lord. I'm going to restate that. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take part of Christ's body and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that uh, I lost my spot. There we go. Don't you know that... Um, I totally lost my spot again. There we go. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute in that way is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So what then should we do? Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. And every other sin a person commits is out, rather, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. And there's all the notes. Let's move on to Ezekiel chapter 4 now. And now you, son of man, take a brick and set it in front of you. Again, this is the Lord speaking to him, or quote, the spirit, unquote, speaking to him. Take a brick and set it in front of you and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege against it. Construct a siege wall and build a ramp pitch military camps and place battering rams against it on all sides. Take an iron plate and set it up as an iron wall between yourself and the city and face it so that it is under siege and besiege it. This will be a sign for the house of Israel. Then lie down on your left side and place the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. You will bear the iniquity. For the number of days you lie on your side. For I have assigned you the years of their iniquity according to the number of days you lie down. Three hundred and ninety days. So you will bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. When you have completed these days, lie down again, but on your right side, and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. No, it's the same body. It's just different sides of the same body. Another thing being shown to the people that while they're separated, they're still one people. Face the siege of Jerusalem with your arm bared and prophesy against it. Be aware that I will put cords on you so that you cannot turn from side to side until you have finished the days of your siege. Also, take wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. Put them in a single container and make them into bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the number of days you lie on your side, 390 days. The food you eat uh, each day will weigh eight ounces. You will eat it at set times. 
You will also drink a ration of water, one-sixth of a gallon, which you will drink at set times. You will eat it as you would a barley cake and bake it over dried human excrement in their sight. The Lord said, This is how the Israelites will eat their bread, ceremonially unclean, among the nations where I will banish them. But I said, Oh, Lord God, I've, I've never been defiled. From my youth until now, I've not eaten anything that died naturally or was mauled by wild beasts. An impure meat has never entered my mouth. He replied to me, Look, I will let you use cow dung instead of human excrement, and you can make your bread over that. And he said to me, Son of man, I am going to cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem, and they will anxiously eat food they have weighed out, and in dread drink rationed water for lack of bread and water. Everyone will be devastated and waste away because of their iniquity. Conclude with Psalm 40 through 41. I waited patiently for Yahweh, and he turned to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me up from a desolate pit out of the muddy clay and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and they will trust in the Lord. How happy, how blessed is anyone who has put his trust in Yahweh and has not turned to the proud or to those who run after lies. Lord, my God, you have done many things, your wondrous works and your plans for us. None can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. You do not delight in sacrifice and in offerings. You open my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or a sin offering. Then I said, See, I have come. In the scroll it is written about me. I delight to do your will, my God, and your instruction is deep within me. I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. See, I do not keep my mouth closed, as you know, Lord. I did not hide your righteousness in my heart. I spoke about your faithfulness and salvation. I did not conceal love and truth from the great assembly. Lord, you do not withhold your compassion from me. Your constant love and truth will always guard me, for troubles without number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I am unable to see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my courage leaves me. Lord, be pleased to rescue me. Hurry to help me, Lord. Let those who intend to take my life be disgraced and confounded. Let those who wish me harm be turned back and humiliated. Let those who say to me, Aha! Aha! be appalled because of their shame. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation continually say, The Lord is great. I am oppressed and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my helper and my deliverer. My God, do not delay. Psalm 41 Happy or blessed is one who is considerate of the poor. The Lord will save him in a day of adversity. The Lord will keep him and preserve him. He will be blessed in the land. You will not give him over to the desire of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him on his sickbed. You will heal him on the bed where he lies. I said, Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak maliciously about me. When will he die and be forgotten? When one of them comes to visit, he speaks deceitfully. He stores up evil in his heart, and he goes out and talks. All who hate me whisper together about me. They plan to harm me. 
Something awful has overwhelmed him, and he won't rise again from where he lives. Or rather, from where he lies. Even my friend, in whom I trusted, one who ate my bread, raised his heel against me. But you, Yahweh, be gracious to me and raise me up. Then I will repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy does not shout in triumph over me. You supported me because of my integrity, and you set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. All right, and that concludes our reading for today, and also book one of the uh, the book of the Psalms. So, uh, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold, the word of the Lord.